Hello, everyone. Let's go ahead and get started. I am so, so excited for this event. Um, I want to welcome you all to an event that we have been planning for a few months now. Um, first and foremost, happy Black History Month. In partnership with AREA, BBSA, UCLA, we are super excited to present to you the Black Entrepreneurship in Real Estate webinar, How to Get Started. So I want to thank all of you for taking some time out of your busy evenings and weeks to join us. My name is Nuvia Warkuko, and I am a first year full-time MBA student at UCLA Anderson. And just a very brief background about myself. I have always had an interest in real estate and absolutely love it. I'm a licensed broker in the state of Illinois. Um, I most recently and owned investment property in Chicago before I moved to LA. So before we get started, I want to make sure we go through some quick logistics here. So first things first, please make sure you mute your mics because this is a Zoom meeting. It's, it's a lot more difficult to kind of control for that. So if you haven't already, please be sure to mute your mics unless you are speaking. Um, another request that I have is to make sure your cameras are on. So our panelists are ready and willing and excited to see all of you. So if you are comfortable and you're able, please feel free to turn your cameras on. And then lastly, we will be ending our session with Q&A. Our panelists have graciously um, agreed to stay on longer if necessary. So just keep that in mind. We're probably going to start Q&A around 745. And the way Q&A will work is that we will be using the raised hand feature in Zoom. So um, if you happen to have any questions before Q&A, feel free to start raising your hand early. And once Q&A starts, I will ask people to come off mute and ask their question live. So just keep that in mind. We want to try to focus on uh, using raised hands when it comes to the Q&A. So all of that said, I am so excited to host all of our panelists. This is going to be a really fun session. Um, if we could rotate our slide, please. Slide delay on the slide, perfect, thank you. So let's go ahead and dive in uh, to each of our panelists' backgrounds. So for each panelist, I would like each of you to go into detail regarding your real estate adventures, what you do, how you do it, how you generate revenue, any successes and achievements you've had, I, the, the floor is really yours. So let's go ahead and start with Courtney and then we'll move on to Michael, then Mark, then Chris. Hello, everybody. Um, my name is uh, Courtney Petway. I'm here based in Louisville, Kentucky. And um, I do a little bit of everything. Uh, my husband and I, uh, we are partners in our company, Petway Estates. And um, we started off flipping houses and then we went into holding. And then with some issues we had early on with contractors, it inspired us to start our own construction company. And so we are now licensed and fully insured general contractors. So um, we started out on the investment side and I now we are also on the construction thousand. side. Two is 28,000. Hi, this is a quick reminder to just make sure you mute your mics. Thank you. So that's a little bit about me. <laughs> Let's move over to Mike. Good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm Michael Banner. I'm the president and the CEO of the Los Angeles LDC. And LDC is an acronym that means local development company. I'm a 30 year plus financial uh, financing uh, expert if I have to toot my own horn. Um, I was a commercial banker for the first decade of my professional career. And then I left banking in the eighties and we are a licensed commercial finance company with a tax exempt status, which means we're nonprofit. And our goal is to help drive capital to lower income communities and especially assist people of color in commercial activities. I do not finance affordable housing. It's small businesses, commercial real estate and middle market uh, business operations. Thank you. 
Thank you, Mike. My name is Mark Jones. I am a student here at UCLA um, Anderson studying real estate and um, social impact. I am the founder, I'm, I'm a Los Angeles native, but um, what I was gonna say is I'm the founder of the Living Rent Free Academy. It's an online brand and business wherein we basically teach people how to break into real estate investing, starting off with two to four unit properties, um, living in one of those units and renting out the rest to eliminate their housing expense. Um, most recently, I began um, working as a real estate agent as well no, no. to um, help people in the Los Angeles market actually acquire um, properties directly. But some of our achievements last year, we helped like over 15 people um, from the Bay Area buy properties to Los Angeles, New York, Connecticut, Ohio, Tennessee, all over the country. Um, people who never thought they could invest in real estate people of all um, backgrounds, um, you know, socioeconomics. So it's been a, a great ride um, and we're proud of what we've done. Thank you. Uh, good evening, everybody. My name is Chris Webley. Uh, I am from North Carolina by way of Jamaica. Um, I studied uh, textile engineering at North Carolina State University. Um, spent seven years working in the corporate retail space uh, for some specialty retailers, Calvin Klein up in New York, Victoria's Secret in Columbus, Ohio, um, and uh, Target in Minneapolis. Um, I initially got into real estate um, when I stayed in Columbus with um, buying a few multifamily properties, which got me into my real estate development career. Um, after being laid off in 2014, um, I decided to follow my vision um, and start my company, New Rules, um, and New Rules is a State uh, Development Collective. Uh, based on the guideline, say that if That's it. Thank you, Chris. Thank all of you for sharing a bit about your backgrounds. I want to make sure that we um, make sure we, we toot your horns. So maybe Courtney, can you share how many doors that you currently own with your husband? How many houses you've flipped over the past couple of years? Yes, right now we own six stores. We have a fourplex and a duplex. Um, and we had just closed on our 30th transaction a week or two ago um, across all of our real estate deals. But as far as flips, we've done 17 or 18. I've kind of <laughs> lost count at this point, but we started at 2017. So this will be year four for us. Um, we hit the door running, uh, hit, hit the ground running, I'm sorry, when we first started. And we did um, 12 flips our first year, 15 deals total. Three of those were wholesales. I'm not sure if people know what wholesaling is, but three of those were wholesales, 12 were flips. Um, and we were able leverage. We were able to leverage other people's money um, doing all of those. And so um, I wouldn't recommend that now. <laughs> and we got a lot smarter. So we have done less deals over time, but made more because now we have a different eye versus when we were just excited new investors. Um, but yeah, that's a little bit about what we've done. Thank you. Um, <laughs> Mark, Michael, Chris, any um, of you kind of want to step in and, and share more about your numbers and um, how much you own or how many people you've helped, any numbers you're willing to share? So, so in my case, uh, I mean, I run a finance company, so we are generally not owners of real estate, but we have financed basically all of the food groups with the exception of housing. I don't do housing and I don't do hotels. <laughs> industrial, retail, office, adapter reuse, done all of those kinds of projects for a wide variety of clients using a wide variety of debt instruments. Some are traditional senior debt, some are MES related. We've done $400 million easily of transaction of which probably about 80% of that $400 million have been with people of color and they've been throughout LA County, some in the Bay Area. Um, top of my head in terms of square footage, 
probably somewhere close to three, 400,000 square, well, I'm actually probably more than that. I've done a couple of 50,000, 100,000 square foot buildings uh, for black developers, which is an anomaly in itself. Thank you, Michael. Awesome. Um, Chris, were you gonna go ahead? Oh, go ahead. Um, I, I, I'll keep it modest. I own three, you know, I own three units here in Los Angeles. Cool. Um, <laughs> <laughs> She's like two Johar is Black History Month. No, seriously. Right. <laughs> no, my um, uh, you know, I, I I think we all have unique stories, and that's one message I want I want to send to everyone. Um, you I love hearing the seed stories, uh, the billionaires, the Rick Caruso's who who have done and developed like the the Grove, and and they start off with duplexes, right? So you can start from from a from a acorn and get to the oak oak tree. So don't feel like you have to be like this um, you know, mogul or anything, but. My portfolio is worth like $900,000 here in Los Angeles. I said I helped like 15 people directly close on properties, but um, we've helped and touched over like 100,000 people in the last year, educating them about real estate, people who had no idea about real estate during the pandemic um, and built a brand from like zero followers to over 30,000 um, engaged people in the community. So uh, again, we're really proud of it, but um I mean, translating those closings to dollars, I don't even know how many, uh, you know, millions worth of real estate we've helped uh, be purchased and put into the community. Um, but yeah, those are some of our accomplishments. Thank you, Mark. Yeah, and I guess I wanna sort of toot our horn sort of philosophically and, and numerically. Um, back when we got started in 2015, um, the name choice of naming our organization New Rules was quite intentional um, in that we wanted to disrupt the status quo um, by what I call modeling a new set of behaviors that we believe developers should lead with in black and brown communities. I think oftentimes we talk about wanting to see change in our communities, but generally approach it with the same problem. Um, and history tells me and my background as an engineer tells me that if you want marginal change, you do something marginally different. If you want drastic change, then you do something drastically different. And because our work is rooted in black and brown communities, we've, uh, our claim to stake has been uh, rooted in doing something different by simply listening to the community and delivering on what has been happening. Um, so back when we got started, um, uh, probably before, um, I even left corporate. We bought, um, similar to Courtney, uh, several uh, wholesale properties, a multifamily triplex and a quadplex that um, we GC designed um, and did rental management in-house. Um, we learned a, a, a shit ton of, of invaluable um, experiences from being in a residential housing space and quickly learned that um, simply providing equitable housing isn't enough um, in black communities. Um, it's one piece to the ecosystem of resources that are needed to set people up for success. And so when I moved to Minneapolis, we switched up our strategy to focus on uh, commercial mixed use spaces um, and using commercial buildings as a central node and using residential around to infiltrate. Um, our flagship location on Lowry in North Minneapolis, which is a historic black neighborhood, um, functions by day as a communal marketplace, um, which was co-created in partnership with the community. Um, everything from the pricing structure to the amenities that we provide by day, it functions as a incubator space for black and brown small businesses and creatives. Um, so there's 4K cameras, there's industrial sewing machines, there's direct to garment screen printing um, and a whole gaggle of other equipment. And then at night, it turns into more of an event space where we've hosted wedding receptions, fundraisers, corporate events, repasses, you name it, we've, we've done it. And then somewhere in between there, we run our retail arm, which is composed of a cafe. Um, we do have our full liquor license um, and, and operate a food cafe out of it as well. Um, from those learnings, um, everything that we do as an organization is based off a of community need. Um, and so where there's a need, we step in as real estate developers to provide and fill that, fill that void. Um, back four years ago, we structured our first uh, $7 million project, um, which broke ground last October. Um, it was a rehab of an existing 9,000 square foot building, which we were able to get nominated on the historic registry. 
um, and there was a new addition off the back. Um, we also, too, have done a series of renovations, ranging from duplexes, single families, all the way up. Um, and then we also, too, have a 25-unit building uh, apartment loft uh, complex that is in contract to close um, here at the end of March. So it's so a little bit about our work and, and what we do. Just a little bit. I love it. Thank you so much, Chris. So I, I want to make sure I level set our conversation with everyone. So when we thought about this idea for this event, one of the biggest goals that we had as organizations here at Anderson was to make real estate feel more within reach and to make it feel like, you know, you could do it too. Um, and so as we kind of go through the questions and the answers, please feel free and comfortable to ask questions um, once it's time for Q&A. Um, just understand that this is a safe space for that. There's no stupid questions. So let's co go ahead and get started in some of the questions that I have prepared. So exposure to the various investing alternatives in real estate is one of the biggest barriers to Black people um, when it comes to entering the real estate market. We often don't know that there's so much more that you can do outside of being an agent or a broker. So how were you first exposed to real estate? And I'm going to direct this question to Mark and then Michael. How did you get exposure to real estate? Um, I was first exposed to real estate by name by a man named uh, Mark Jones, my my father. Uh, he owned real estate in Los Angeles, and he he was just like a really dynamic uh, guy that just taught me about the benefits and the vision and the possibility of real estate. And he loved to say how um, you know it's passive and how you can control it um, and also, I got exposed by being an L.A. native. I saw the rise. We purchased a property near the Grove. That's like near um, like Pico, Fairfax area in um, 97 for like 190,000. Um, and by like 2007, it went up to over a million dollars. So I saw the, the power of appreciation. Um, I saw a lot of the developments. I mentioned Rick Caruso. Um, so I saw a lot of his developments in L.A., um, and it just was like amazing to see like hard assets and physical things turn from a vision in someone's mind to a shared space. Um, and so that's how I was first exposed, the, the great developers here. And then also my father kind of showing me the ropes with, um, with real estate and its benefits. So, Well, you know, in, in my case, because I was a banker, I think that that really is what piqued my interest. Uh, you know, I grew up in Watts. My, lucky my parents owned their house, a little small house that they paid a few thousand dollars for. And ultimately, we were relocated after the Watts riots as part of, you know, urban renewal, CRA coming in, saying we want to fix the community. We'd like to offer you, I think, $20,000 for the house. And we moved to Compton after that. and. When I became a banker though, it made me understand how it, and when people got money <laughs> and how you could effect, effectively, you can invent money out of thin air. It shocked me when I found out when I was working in a bank and you could fill out a pink piece of paper, put some numbers on it, put zeros and commas, put it in a machine, poof, there's money, millions of dollars. And you know, I was kind of flabbergasted by that, but I got the, I really got the bug for real estate once I found out within the bank, a commercial bank, that the people who were always thought to be the most important were the ones that had portfolios or, you know, a bunch of commas behind whatever they did. And so, you know, we kind of talked about that tonight earlier about, you know, don't get intimidated uh, because somebody says a billion dollars or 500 million, whatever that number is. And but when I saw that, those are the people who got the most attention figured out that, you know, real estate kind of drives big numbers. So, you know, you can do a very small real estate transaction and it could be millions of dollars where if you did something else, you know, I had to make a bunch of commercial loans, lines of credits to manufacturers, whatever. And I had to do like 10 of them to get the $10 million. I could do one real estate transaction to be at $10 million. So that was kind of pushed me in, in, in that direction. And the rest of it is kind of luck in some respects. Um, you know, I've owned rental properties. You know, I've rehabbed properties. 
I've owned condos. I've done all of those kinds of things along the way. But for me, real estate was the one thing that you could make a physical difference in the environment. And that really attracted me to it. And, you know, the longer I stayed in it, I was really flabbergasted when I could point to a building and says, oh, that building over there in that corner? Oh, that's me. If it wasn't for me, it wouldn't be standing there. And the building's there for 20 or 30 years. So that's where I got the bug. Thank you, Michael. I love that. Yeah. Real estate shapes our, our entire world. Um, and it's just insane what a role it plays in all of our lives. So to have a, a touch of that is it's really rewarding. So I, I resonate with all of that. So another question for you all. So 90% of the world's millionaires play in the real estate game. And we all know true wealth often comes from ownership. So why real estate? And what was the catalyst behind your decision to do your own thing when it came to real estate and being an entrepreneur? So we're going to start with Courtney and then move over to Mark. Um. Honestly, freedom for me. <laughs> um, I wanted to own my time. Um, I'm also big on family. And although um, I, I was fortunate to um, be able to quit my corporate job, thankfully, and uh, my husband actually just quit his as well. So we're now officially both full time entrepreneurs. But really, it was just the freedom and the options, you know, not having to be tied down to a nine to five. Um, uh, and of course, the money was the, <laughs> the benefit, but you were not able to achieve the freedom, right, without the money. So the money was the tool just to get to the ultimate goal. Um, being able to spend time, especially I mentioned earlier, I have two little kids, you know, being able to be fully present, you know, watch and see all their mind, milestones. You know, you can't put a price on that. And so for me, that's really what it was about was achieving that freedom. And so my husband and I, we were like, OK, how can we achieve this? And what could give us the most amount of money <laughs> without exchanging, uh, with exchanging the least amount of time um, to achieve our goal, which was freedom and real estate was a no brainer. You know, we talk about, you know, one flip done right replaces or is the um, average American salary. Um, our third flip, we netted around $40,000 in a few months. Some people grossed that in a whole year. And so it was like, this is a no brainer. <laughs> Why not continue to do this? And so um, we, we started off uh, uh, flipping to build, gen generate capital. And then we ventured off into rentals. And then we just kind of blossomed into doing um, other real estate related streams from there. I want to uh, echo what uh, Courtney said. Um, it's, the free it's the freedom. But for me, it was it was the possibilities, right? I, I looked at myself and I said, okay, I have this career. I have this one life. Um, I have a background in healthcare. So I'm a dietitian by trade. Um, you know, I worked in the communities. I, I speak Spanish. So I saw myself, you know, in healthcare, but, I, but then I thought about impact, like how far can I go? Um, what kind of legacy can I leave? And kind of like what Mike said is, you have these built environments that kind of like new rules is building where you can change how um, people uh, live and how people experience their environment. So um, whether that's like creating a community center, um, if it's a mixed use um, building or having a wonderful place for people to shop um, and grow and, or convene, uh, real estate provides all of that. And um, I think it's the zeros. When I was a kid and I saw all those like zeros behind that, um, you know, mm -hmm. that, uh, that, that transaction, that appreciation uh, over the years, um, my net worth has gone up quite a bit by owning real estate in, in Los Angeles and in California. Um, and it's so much easier. And, and in terms of doing your own thing, I want to inspire people in the audience. Um, it's like when you just have an employer, you're limited to serving your employer. Um, when you service the masses and you're an entrepreneur, you can affect, you know, it's an unlimited amount of people you can, you can serve. Right. So, um, she did 12 flips in a, in a year, she said in her first year, uh, versus, you know, just having that one or two assignments at the, at the job, um, and your income can be, can be unlimited. Um, so I, I really love real estate, especially in the digital, um, space and like crowd, crowdfunding and, 
um, kind of having an online presence and, and, and raising money uh, digitally is becoming more and more popular uh, with people like Grant Cardone, Jay Morrison, et cetera. So um, it was just really appealing on all kinds of levels for me. That's why I chose real estate. Thank you both. So if I heard you all correctly, it's it's the zeros, it's the ability to build generational wealth in your family, which is pretty powerful through real estate. And it's the impact that you can make in, in a lot of people's lives that kind of often go um, and notice. So thank you both. Let's go ahead and transition over to the kind of the business viability of being a real estate investor. So let's talk about access to capital. Um, one of the biggest barriers when it comes to entry into real estate for the black community. So who are your investors and how did you access capital initially? How was your investor, how has your investor strategy changed over the time that you've um, had your various real estate adventures? So let's go ahead and start with Chris and then we'll move over to Courtney. Um, yeah, um, so this is a probably, I guess, I think unanimous across the boards, but I'm simply my investor. Um, I, and I would say, honestly, I would keep it that way as long as you can. I think a lot of the folks on this panel can probably attest to that. Um, so when I first got started, I was laid off from uh, my corporate job and that was initially what gave me the push. But ultimately I had a few investment properties before that, um, before being laid off. So I was using my corporate nine to five check to then um, sort of invest into properties. And so by the time I got laid laid off, I was like, ah, I don't know that I necessarily need a job um, to continue to do, um, to stay, to uh, have financial means. And so I took that sign as a leap of faith to continue down this path and do it full time. Um, I, for me, again, I, I said earlier that I'm an investor and I, I there's been a, a, a slew of experiences that would keep me on that path. But I would say there's a few things to bootstrapping that I think are invaluable. Um, the first thing is that it forced me to learn the trades. Um, my first three projects, I was the GC. So I, like Courtney, I did everything from installing windows to installing floors and pulling electric lines and you name it. That was me. I was everything from beginning to end. And it wasn't I'd a, it wasn't ideal, but it taught me the process to how you build a house, which I think is invaluable as you start to continue to do more deals. You start to learn the process, um, you know, learning the process and best practices are, I felt were invaluable at the time. Um, and I'm, it was funny because I, I look back now, um, I, I, a lot of bankers, I um, had some very choice words for because um, you know, we tried down the path of traditional financing, like most folks, and uh, were unable to get any financing. And I, I look back now and I laugh because if I was able to get the finance that I was looking for to do these rehabs, nine out of the 10, I would have wasted a lot of money. Um, and so when you don't have money, you're forced to do it um, sort of bootstrapping. It forces you to learn the process and it forces you to be resourceful. Um, when I, you know, so obviously that was getting started. Um, what that allowed me to do was build my portfolio. Um, I think as naturally people can continue to see us be consistent with the product that we were putting out, people started to come and knock on our doors. Um, and maybe a few years ago, we, we did our first joint venture deal, um, which, you know, I, I could have, a, again, a few choice words for that engagement. But, um, you know, when we're doing work in black and brown communities, just traditionally, um, I would, I, and I hate to say it, but the white savior sort of complex of, you know, folks who have deeper pockets than me who want to come along and be a part of this journey. Um, and I, I, there's this saying that there's the worst kind of racists aren't the ones who hate you. Uh, the worst ones are the ones who want to come save us. Um, and I think that we as black and brown people have to protect and carve out the, the work that we're doing in these spaces, because if we're not careful, um, we end up on the receiving end of the stick. Um, a few years ago, so, uh, 
So, you know, that deal wasn't structured in a way that really set us up for success. So we were able to get out of it, fortunately enough. Um, and so today's sort of how our, our work has pivoted um, from an investing perspective to now. Hey, Chris, you are on mute right now. Oh, sorry, can you hear me? Yep. Um, so yeah, so today how our strategy has changed, we do a lot of one-on-one um, -on -one, uh, sort of fundraising with different foundations and philanthropy. Um, and quite honestly, you know, while we've been able to get grant funds, a lot of the grant funds that we receive actually don't come from applying for a grant. It's based off of relationships. And so oftentimes for a project, we'll put together a one pager. Um, we'll have a sit down conversation with the executive director of that organization and, you know, a check is cut. And so we found really great success in those strategies. Um, and so, and that allows us to retain 100% ownership of all of our projects as we think about getting to scale. So there's a few ways that we've been able to invest, how we got started and sort of where we're at today in terms of investing. Um, so uh, I was, uh, I started a little different. So uh, we actually had no money to, to really invest in real estate. And I think what uh, people find attractive, uh, especially by our story, is that we are like your everyday people who didn't start, you know, with a handout. And well, I won't say a handout because we did have help, but we were, we essentially were creative with what, um, how we funded our deals. So for example, we were able to get 100% private money to fund our first um, investment deal, which was a flip. We did a joint venture with just a regular individual, wasn't an organization or anything. It was just a person who had a lot of money in their retirement account. <laughs> and we pretty much, I, I, a lot of people are familiar with Shark Tank. And I try to tell people it's a good example with how we pitch to our investors. It's like Shark Tank. This is the deal. These are the comps. These this is the rehab, this is the purchase, this is the projected return. Um, will you give us X amount in exchange for a percentage? Um, and then you'll get paid at sale or refinance. So um, our first deal was a joint venture and we were able to secure, we were mid twenties, had never done a deal in our life, didn't know anything about real estate, <laughs> barely, but we educated ourselves and we sounded like we knew what we were talking about at the time. And they gave us $170,000 first deal. Um, after that, because uh, we wanted to actually try hard money. And for people who don't know what hard money is, it's a, a good um, alternative. Um, it's, it's one alternative, I'll say, to funding a flip because they will wrap the renovation costs um, into your loan with them. But the kick, the downside with hard money lender, most of them, of course, are going to require some experience. They're not just going to give you a whole lot of money and you've never done anything. So that was the roadblock we kept running into. It was like, well, dang, we need this money, but we don't have a, a portfolio or experience to get the money. So it was like, you know, a constant roadblock. So we, we, we just reached out to private lenders like, hey, we have this property it's a great return. We just need money to buy it. Um, we pitched, um, I'm sorry, so many investors. We got no after no after no, but all we needed was that one yes. Um, and we got that one yes. And then the rest is history. Um, they still lend to us today. And from that one, we were able to then go to a hard money lender to say, hey, we did our first flip. Then they finally gave us the money. But then after doing a few flips of hard money, we were like, oh, y'all charge too much. <laughs> y'all have too many points and high interest rates. We want to go back to private money. And so by that time, we had built up a portfolio. We were able to actually show receipts to, again, regular, everyday individuals. And we, can, and we were able to show them the benefit of investing with us versus their money just sitting in a bank. Um, for example, we closed on a property Two weeks ago, again, fully funded by 100% private money. They gave us the money for everything, uh, purchase repairs, uh, carrying costs, all of that. And uh, we negotiated a percentage. And this person, just by wiring funds, is going to make a minimum twelve to $13,000 in just a few months by lending with us. I guarantee she would have not made that. 
in the bank. <laughs> so it's just pitching and showing how um, it can benefit them. And then we use creative strategies like um, some people may have heard of subject twos, which is um, acquiring properties. Um, you acquire the deed um, subject to an existing mortgage. So you get the title, but the individual stays on the loan or there's, you know, lease options where you lease can control a property. Um, so there's so many ways that a lot of black people are not exposed to um, on how to acquire property and build for portfolios and capital. It's just not talked about. The only thing we know is we got to go to a bank, get a loan, uh, put down a, a down payment of 20% plus closing costs. That's the way most of us were taught. And when I was introduced to this whole new world of I can build a portfolio without having to shell out 20% every single time my mind was blown. It was like, like I can do this. <laughs> so it's just a rinse and repeat after that. Thank you, Courtney. Yeah, I appreciate you sharing that. There's a lot of interesting ways that you can get into real estate, but something that you said resonated um, was showing people the benefits and kind of the power of real estate and the, the opportunities as far as a return is concerned, um, as opposed to traditional investment strategies. So thank you for sharing. Um, so going to switch gears a little bit. So HGTV, we all know HGTV and it can make real estate look super fun. It can make it almost look easy, but we all know as investors, it is not easy <laughs> at all. So what has been one of the biggest challenges you've had to overcome in your success and um, how did you go about doing that? So I'm going to direct this question to Chris and to Michael. Okay, I'll jump in here. Um, so I sort of bucketed it as a few different challenges. Um, uh, the first challenge, at least for us, has been uh, building up the team to help scale the work that we do. Um, I define our work as a real estate development group, but I would argue that uh, at least 60 to 70 percent of our transactions are rehab focused. Um, sort of how I define a develop being a developer um, is new construction from the ground up on vacant land. Um, and so a lot of our capacity is sort of tied up into my experience of what I've experienced um, in my space as a real estate um, developer, quote unquote. Um, so I would say the, so one of the biggest challenges that we've had is building up our team, um, which I would say is somewhat by choice. Um, the work that we do, uh, we've been quite intentional about wanting to bring, a, bring along black and brown kids who look like us from the community um, to teach them the trade, to show them the ins and outs. And so while there's definitely a lot of coaching and hands-on involvement in that space, is definitely the flip side of that is that we're, we're legacy building by showing other folks who look like us that this work can be done and building a pipeline for future developers. Um, sort of one of the other pieces, and maybe this is a little bit controversy, um, but is honestly is keeping our, keeping the work from being co-opted. Um, a lot of meetings I walk out of feeling like, oh, did I say too much or give too much sauce about how we do the work that we do? Um, and the formula to doing this work. Um, you know, I, I, I don't believe in hoarding knowledge, um, but there are a lot of people who uh, will use the narrative of the black struggle um, in black and brown neighborhoods to get the funding and the resources that they need to do this work. And um, history has told me that you know, we, we have to protect the work that we're doing and, and protect the narratives. Um, because at the end of the day, I, I think a lot of people, there's a lot of people out here doing, doing the work who s use the narrative to get the funds and then they turn around and do the same sort of traditional status quo behaviors of, and as I mentioned earlier, um, a big piece that have, has separated us or has been our uh, sort of telling factor in the community is our ability to think differently about how we do things. And so, um, you know, there's not a, a lot of traditional red tape when we're doing projects. You know, there's the homie who's walking down the street, 
you know, there's been plenty of times where it's 2 a.m. in the morning and I'm just boarding up one of the buildings that we're working on. And a homie just is walking by and it's like, hey, you need help with that? And he's helping me board up the building. Then tomorrow he's back helping unload the truck from materials. And a lot of the relationships that we've built have started from just those organic interactions in the community. And so I don't take the work that we do lightly. Um, and, and when we say that we're gonna do something in the community, it means something to me. I think the last thing, the last challenge that we've, we have been uh, sort of challenged with as of late is actually just sort of knowing when to say no. Um, every project isn't a yes. Um, every partner who wants to come into the neighborhood and do, and do this work it's not a yes. Um, I think initially when we started down this path of doing the work, we were often sort of felt like we had to say yes, because honestly, there just wasn't any other options. Um, but now that we've grown and scaled our work, the ball is in our court. And so we uh, there's more no's than yeses going out in terms of the people who we're willing to work with. Um, you know, we spend a lot more time these days making sure that there's a strong value alignment to the work that we're doing, because at the end of the day, we've we've promised a product to the community that I can't sleep at night if if we don't deliver on that. And so um, I think you have to learn how to protect your time. You know, I, I've as of recent or probably within the last year, it's like if you call me Friday at the three o'clock. I'm out of the office having a beer with my team. Like we, and don't, don't call me and don't, we're not talking about any work until Monday when I'm back in the office, you know, and just little things of, of that nature of just carving out, you know, personal time and time away from the work. And that's okay. Because initially I think when we got started in this space, I felt like we had to be everything to everyone. And I think a lot of the folks on the panel would tell you that that, is a strategy that, that leads to burnout. So those are a few challenges that we face in this space. What was the question again? <laughs> so the question was, what is one of the biggest challenges you've had to overcome in your success and, and how did you go about doing that? Um, so for me, um, since I'm on the money side of this equation, this discussion, um, I think one of the things that I would tell folks that you have to be able to com communicate to anybody is that you you can be trusted. Uh, because most people don't want to get involved in some bad story. And, and, and if they're smart, they will do some due diligence. They want to try to find out if what you're saying, you know, passes the sniff test. And because, you know, my experience as a lender, once the money's out the door, you know, they're on the, they're on the other side of the equation now. You know, they can respond to you when they want to now because they got the money. So trustworthiness is a very critical part in all of this. And I think for me, it's I was lucky in as much because I was a banker and, you know, days gone by bankers were trustworthy people. I don't know if that's the case today, you know, based on all of the bad behavior that we've seen. And because of that, and this goes to relationships, when I decided to leave the corporate world, and I left the fifth largest bank in the country at the time when I left. And, you know, I had a good career. Things are going great. And for some crazy reason, I thought I wanted to go for a, work at a smaller bank. So I left a $35 billion bank and went to work for a $500 million bank. And it was culture shock. Uh, even though the $500 million bank, these are the smart guys running it. These are the kind of guys that would start up a bank, build it up, sell it off, wait five years and do it again over and over again. Um, the difference between a $35 billion bank, and I think it's relative in this conversation, is that the bandwidth of what you can do when you have a balance sheet you know, mistakes don't show up, you know, at, at $100,000 if you're a $35 billion bank. You got to lose or have a bad idea on, you know, billions of dollars. So when you're smaller, though, you know, and you're working on a $100,000 project, $10,000 can wipe you out. <laughs> and so you have to be conscious of that, that you are working in a, a risk environment. 
real estate is not risk free. It's not like buying a treasury bond. You put it in a bank and you get, I don't know, you get 50 basis points today. You know, you want to make $12,000 $12, in 90 days. That tells you that something's going to happen that creates a significant amount of value. Now, if it shows up, that's great. If it doesn't, well, you, maybe you don't make the 12000 And I will tell you that the challenges that I faced 20 years ago, the same challenges that literally are out there today, and that is still having access to the right people under the right conditions at the right time. I mean, I would assume that, you know, just from being in this conversation, there's some bright people here. And it's not as if you can't be successful if you're given the opportunity and the right resources. Putting those two things together are oftentimes challenging. Um, and I think um, Chris hit on this in terms of how you take deals that you should take and pass on deals that you shouldn't. And then everybody that shows up, uh, I think did Mark say this, everybody shows up is not your friend, <laughs> you know? Uh, and in my experience in working with uh, developers, business owners of color, it's very easy to have a great idea and get crammed out. Because what happens is the lack of access to capital is what they kind of keep turning the, the faucet off and moving themselves up to take over. And I can tell you, I've got friends that have projects today that three, four hundred million dollar projects and they're scuffling to try to keep it alive. Because when you take down, typically if you take down land and you've got some holding costs, that is a problem that you can only solve generally with money. There's no creativity <laughs> that's gonna do that. It's because somebody wants a, a return on their investment or a check. And you know, I actually was in a deal and I'll, I'll keep this short. So you know, my involvement in all this comes out of the Community Reinvestment Act and banks having them do things in low-income communities. That's kind of what I'm a specialist in. But I would tell you, I was in this deal and I got sued <laughs> by the city of Los Angeles for $11 million. And it was a, a bureaucratic manufactured lawsuit. I told them that, look guys, yes, I wanna get out of business with you, you know, wrong partner kind of thing. What you should get back from me is a million dollars. You want it here to write the check and, and, and we'll call it a divorce and we go our separate ways. But the bureaucrats that are involved in this thought that they were gonna get $12 million. So it cost me probably maybe $200,000 uh, uh, between my time and, and, and legal expenses to give them $800,000. <laughs> but it took three and a half years to get rid of them. So coming out of that now, it's like, okay, and this is uh, it's like five, six years ago. So now, reputationally, people ask me all the time, hey, Mike, what happened? Is that $12 million thing gone? Because you can't talk to anybody when somebody's suing you for $12 million and tell them it's stupid and they're not going to get it, but people don't believe it until they actually see it. So coming out of that, resolving that, and then coming back up and say, oh, you're still alive, but now you're back to day one. Okay, prove it to me again that you can, you know, we can, we can invest $10, 20000000 million with you and it all work. So credibility has a lot to do with all of this. And there is a double standard in credibility for us. Don't, don't even begin to think it's not. You know, in the days where somebody will tell you, oh, we got your package, we're going to look at it, and we're going to send it downtown kind of thing. I used to be downtown. And trust me, there were, there would be people that would send me stuff that I didn't know and didn't trust. It got put on the bottom of the pile. <laughs> And the people who I knew and trusted would move to the top of the pile, just kind of sign it sight unseen. So, you know, maintaining a, a reputation is one of the most important things that you can do. And, because, and first of all, we don't get that many shots, so we almost have to be perfect. And so minimizing mistakes is a very important key thing that I would tell everybody to look at. The fewer mistakes that you have, uh, the fewer things that people can hold against you and put them out there as roadblocks. Thank you, Michael, and, and thank you to all of our panelists. We are running a little bit behind on Q&A, so we're going to go ahead and transition over to that. Um, so as a reminder, if you are interested in asking a question, please raise your hand. Um, you should see a raise hand feature, I think top right 
corner of your screen. Um, and so we're going to go through the hands um, to take care of questions. So feel free to ask your questions. Like I said, this is a safe space. We're gonna go ahead and start with Q. Um, just make sure you unmute yourself when you ask your question. Hello, I wanna first uh, thank you guys and the panel for uh, taking the time to give us this very insightful information. Uh, thanks, it's very valuable and it's a lot we can, uh, we can take from it. So I do wanna first ask, this question is for Mark and or Courtney. Uh, you know, we've, at least personally, we've taken advantage of programs like, you know, NACA or FHA and are able to get into that initial investment, you know, multifamily property, which otherwise we probably wouldn't have qualified for. So, I, but I think the challenge is how do we go from, okay, that first property where we can take it, we can take advantage of, you know, no PMI, down payment assistance, but then how do we, you know, expand our portfolio and take that next step to invest in other properties where we don't necessarily have the benefits of a program like FHA or NACA? Um, I can, I can answer that from what I teach, um, teach my, my clients. Um, it's kind of, so what he's talking about is like purchasing so for some people in the audience who don't know, um, FHA is the federal housing administration. Um, they started it in the great depression to stimulate the economy and people to invest in real estate, but it allows you to put down 3.5% instead of that traditional 20% plus closing costs. Um, and sorry, my screen just flipped. Uh, so, uh, 3.5% instead of the 20% down, um, you can buy up. Yeah. Like, uh, like y'all been talking about it. Hi, as a awesome. reminder, please make sure you're on mute. Thank you for muting. Um, and you can buy multifamily properties. Uh, what people don't know is that you can use the FHA program multiple time, times. It doesn't stand for first time homeowners. Uh, it's, it's Federal Housing Administration. So you can use the FHA program um, again and again. So Q for your situation, um, as the equity rises and it increases um, and you can refinance from FHA to conventional, you could then go move out and buy another multi-unit, a four-unit, triplex or whatever, um, FHA again. Um, or you could use some of the more creative methods like buying out of state, um, you know, buying uh, investment properties that are like in uh, more affordable markets. I don't know where you're located, but um, like in the Midwest and things like that, it's, it's a little bit cheaper. Um, or if you buy right, um, with the NACA program, you could be living for free or living rent free, as I call it, with my brand and all your income from yourself and your wife could just go straight towards um, investments or, or building up that that next um, down payment. And then the last thing I would say is like the private money piece. But I think Courtney could speak more could speak more to that. She's just creative with that with that part. Of course, I wouldn't. There's a lot that goes into it. So, of course, I wouldn't be able to cover everything. But uh, house hacking or living rent free, like Mark says, is a great way for um, people who are interested in diving into real estate and want to get their feet wet. Um, it's a great way. But um, again, if you are not in a, um, I guess, a, um, uh, a an investor friendly market, um, and for example, Louisville, you know, you can, we have a house under contract right now for $99,000 turnkey in a decent side of town, but that's because we're in Louisville. You're not going to find that, you know, in California and markets, you know, it's totally different. So you could also consider investing out of state. Um, like for example, our buyers list, we have a lot of people who are in expensive markets and they want to, you know, get into investing, but they just are not in an investor friendly market. They might be in your Miamis or New Jersey's and New York's where, although it's not impossible, it's a lot more difficult um, to get into that space there. And so that's one way. Again, I also mentioned private money. Um, unfortunately, you can't Google uh, private money lenders. It's really all about networking, going to local real estate groups, um, offline and online, joining those real estate meetups. I'm talking, telling everybody um, what you do and how, again, how investing with you can benefit you. Um, another way is some people have their opinion on wholesaling. For people who don't know what wholesaling is, it's basically getting a property under contract, assigning your contract for a fee. Um, and it's a great way, although you're not owning real estate, it's a great way if you're looking to build capital to afford, you know, a down payment on a future 
multi-unit so you can house hack um, or a down payment for a conventional loan for a rental or a down payment to buy a property for your first split. It's a great way to build capital. Um, again, some of the creative strategies that I talked about um, where um, you're subject to where you get the title, but you find a distressed seller who's just trying to get out of their mortgage and you're taking over their mortgage payments. Um, there's so many ways out there. You just have to pretty much almost choose one, um, take calculated risks, do your due diligence, know, understand there are pros and cons to whatever strategy you choose. Um, but there are so many ways where you can um, begin investing in real estate with very little um, to no money. It's possible because I've done it, done it multiple, <laughs> multiple times. Um, Mark and I can't, and, and I believe Chris um, can speak to, although there will be challenges, um, it's not impossible. And I think that's the beauty of this panel is because you're seeing everyday people who made it happen. And to my knowledge, we didn't, we weren't trust fund babies. Um, we used to think real estate was reserved for the elite and it's not. And so with this knowledge, we realize how accessible it really is to us. Thank you. Thank you guys. Thank you. As a reminder, everyone, our panelists have agreed to stay on for um, a few extra minutes. So if you do have a question, uh, we will get it answered. So just keep that in mind. Um, we are going to go ahead and transition over to the next question. Um, I think this is Chiniere. Please correct me if I said your name wrong. Feel free to come off mute and ask your question. Thank you. Yeah, that was perfect. Um, thank you all for being here tonight. Um, I'm 23 and, and I just graduated from UCLA a couple years ago. And so I'm preparing for grad school, but I know that I'm interested in, in kind of entering this space. Um, so this is all really, really valuable. Um, one of the questions that I have is about what the, um, what the environment looks like with COVID right now. Um, I know that some of you mentioned having mixed use spaces and of course having um, spaces for families. And I'm just wondering, how do you sort of build uh, resiliency or sustainability into your investments when you have something kind of precarious right now, like COVID, where um, people might not be able to pay their rents in the same sort of way, or, or you know, just maybe the spaces aren't being used as, as frequently as they would have been used. So I guess, what are you doing in your own portfolios and what, might, uh, what advice might you have for um, those of us that are trying to get into um, the space? Um, I can maybe jump in here. Um, so we have both commercial and residential spaces. Um, sort of the way our approach is sort of looking at everything from a portfolio lens. Um, and so I'll just sort of give you the quick rundown of what we have on the books now. Um, we recently just wrapped up, I think it was four doors um, down in North Carolina that we flipped. Um, those were, I think, six month projects in and out. Um, and those, pro those projects, similar to Courtney's, you know, yielded about 30 to 40,000 per door. Um, which gave us the liquid cash to then um, divert into a 25-unit building uh, up in Minneapolis, where we're headquartered out of. Um, and so the building currently right now is about, um, I guess, running 13000 behind on rent, um, which isn't terrible, um, given that there's 25 units and each unit is about 1300 a door. Um, so our sort of approach is that it's a portfolio, um, based approach. Um, we do have a commercial space that has been closed since last year, roughly, um, uh, to the public. So in terms of revenue, it's drastically decreased. Um, and so when we see those decreases in cash flow, we switch up our strategy to focus on smaller, quicker plays that can yield. Um, a quick turn. So i.e. that's why we got into those plays in North Carolina, where we were able to quick turn, we bought some properties, wholesale cash, um, rehab them cash and sold them. Um, and so those allowed us, again, the cash to do other projects. Um, and with regards to sort of rent, you know, we're, we just bought this 25 unit, or we're in the process of closing on a 25 unit um, building in, in the heart of North Minneapolis. 
which is a historically black neighborhood, um, is at 50% AMI. So a lot of the, the tenants are making less than 30,000 a year. Um, and so, and a lot of them were behind the rents, you know, quite frankly. Um, Minneapolis luckily has a lot of um, COVID relief grants as well as grants for tenants who are behind on rent. Um, and so we've been working, the existing landlord has been working with the tenants um, to get use, utilize those programs and we will continue to um, sort of emphasize those programs moving forward. So um, quite honestly, COVID, it sounds kind of capitalist when you think about it, that it's opened up a lot of opportunities for folks who have cash on the books and can do something because there are people who are looking to get out of their situations. Um, so it has opened up some unique opportunities for us to get into. Um, but we're just as aggressive. Um, and I would say last year, the pandemic was probably, our, was, is, wasn't probably, was our strongest year financially um, since we've been open. But I think it's all about your strategy, just learning to pivot your strategy based off of where the market is at, because the market is always going to fluctuate and be up and down. Any other panelists want to add to kind of the, the impact of COVID? I'd say for me, it's, a, it's, a, it's a still an open story that's unfolding. I was listening to a, a, a presentation from Bank of America's CEO today, earlier today. And they talked about how their credit quality has gotten better. Uh, and they, they're projecting that it's going to stabilize. Uh, another call I was on earlier in this, this, this morning we talked about in corridors throughout America where there are higher income communities, they're coming back a lot faster than lower income communities. So for me, I think what I believe I'm going to see is that in lower income communities where properties are going to come back, either they're going to go back to lenders, and I'm not sure whether they can get bundled and, and blown out, or they're going to get more than likely if the bank's taken back, that's going to happen. But I also think there's a lot of opportunistic money that is just kind of sitting there waiting, you know, to buy on the dips again. Now, whether or not they've got some solution to turn it into an income producing property again, time will only tell. Uh, but, you know, I think we're still in a dicey stage until the pandemic is rationalized by most people. Thank you, Michael. And, and to kind of round, round out this comment, I, I know something I'm learning in class, I'm still a newbie, but it's it, this is why it's so important to buy right. Um, it's so that you can weather these storms and the economic um, environment that we're in, right? So when you're buying, it's really important that when you're running your numbers, that you buy in a way that keeps in mind kind of the cyclical nature of real estate. Um, so keep that in mind as well. All right, let's move over to James. Feel free to ask your question, come off mute. Thank you. Uh, just a quick question. I live in the Bay Area, um, I own a, um, my own property, but I'm looking to get into uh, multifamily and just curious for the panelists, um, first and foremost, is maintaining an existing employment a requirement in terms of like uh, seeking funding for, you know, a second property? Um, and then if not, or if, and if so, or if not, then how do you, what's the best you know, approach to getting capital for properties. If I let's say, for example, I took a break from you know my corporate gig. I can. Um, yeah. oh, okay, <laughs> uh, go ahead, Mark. Thank you. I I was gonna say, um, in order to get a a loan, um, a, tr a traditional loan, um, the banks want to see that you can prove that you can pay it back. So uh, unfortunately, if you want to like go and invest into a multifamily property, um, you're going to want to, you're going to have to prove to the bank that you have that, 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 that income backing it. Um, in terms of creative strategies, there's a, there's many, um, but in terms of just a traditional financing for, um, you know, 25% down on a, on a four unit or triplex or something, you'll need a income, document income. 
Um, I want to piggyback off of that. Um, definitely, again, if you're going the traditional lender route, but um, again, I like to expose people to things they may have not thought about. And uh, we were able to get one of our duplexes. Uh, well, our duplex was through seller finance deal, um, where you're going directly to the seller and you're negotiating with the individual. Uh, again, no banks involved. Of course, there's still contract and there's paperwork and there's a legal process. And I'm not just, you know, it's not just a handshake, right? So there is documentation that you need to um, have, but seller finance is a way where you can acquire properties going directly to the seller and they essentially kind of act as the bank um, per se. And so of course you don't have, of course you still have a moral obligation to make sure you have the reserves and the cash to make sure you're making those payments to the seller. But as far as, you know, credit checks and um, having to go through all of the red tape, like uh, banks and lenders will require, um, that's the beauty of going through an off-market seller finance route. So again, guys, just when you're looking at real estate, expand, you want to expand your mind to thinking outside of the box. When you begin to think outside of the box, you'll see so many opportunities available to you. Had we only tried to use traditional lending, we wouldn't have been able to grow at the pace that we had. Um, I can't speak for everyone. I just know for myself because the length of time and the requirements. So you have to begin thinking outside of the box. If you see a viable deal and you might not necessarily be able to go through a bank because you know you don't have the employment history required or the credit score, that should not deter you or stop you from investing in real estate. I guess my question is, and where I, why I mentioned the personal home is that I have an asset. So I'm teetering between taking a new gig because I just uh, left my current gig. And so a part of that decision making is my strategy for this year is to own a multifamily. Right. And to increase uh, to begin passive income. And so. Right. And also pay for this enormous debt that I'm going to incur with Anderson at some point. Right. When, when I get off a of deferment. So there's that, too. Um, so really just trying to see what, and to your point, Courtney, about alternative strategies from the traditional route, right, for securing financing and still being able to achieve my goals, which is having additional doors and having that passive income and creating that generation of wealth. I don't know if you saw my little princess interrupt my our Zoom meeting. She likes the photo bomb, but this is for her. It's not really for me. Does anyone, oh, go ahead. I was going to just drop a small, a small C, so, something that we're doing uh, now. I have a business partner. Um, we're do, using the sweat equity, um, the knowledge, and we're raising money and bringing in those passive investors to buy multifamily properties. So um, if you, you know, somebody said uh, how to start with zero, zero dollars. Sometimes like that, that knowledge and the, the will to do, to do something is worth more than the money. So that's another creative way of doing it is, is, is bringing in those partners and saying, Hey, I have this Anderson degree and you know, a lot of debt behind it, but I can put it to use and, and, and get you a good, good yield. So that's a, that's a, a possibility. Well, just let me add one basic concept. If you're thinking about real estate and you're, it's not something you're going to live in, the real estate needs to be thought of as an income producing asset. Of course. Based on the kind of income it can produce and the stability of it, that income determines what your capital stack is going to have to look, look like. But you got to have an income producing property. I mean, you know, you get to a certain level where you put up 25 percent, you have no recourse. Nobody comes to talk to you because if it doesn't work, they just take the property. You lost 25 percent. I mean, that's the kind of institutional world of real estate investing. Um, and anything below that is, a, you know, a, um, an amalgamation of sweat equity, seller financing, all these other things. What you're trying to get to is you put up enough of somebody else's 25 percent, get 75 percent from a conventional lender, and you just sit there and watch money go back and forth. OK, no, that's solid. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you for your question, James. Um, I see a question in the chat from maybe, and I'm sorry if I'm mispronouncing your name, is seller financing an option in all states 
And is an attorney needed in the transaction? Courtney, are you um, familiar with this answer? I can't speak for all states. I would say do your due diligence. We, even though it's not required where I am for an attorney, I use an attorney for our contracts. Um, we have a really great uh, um, relationship with our title company. So even my seller financing deals, any questions I have, contracts still come from an attorney. I just don't trust myself and I'm not trying to get caught up. <laughs> so I advise using attorney, um, but I can't can't speak for all states, unfortunately, but I know if anybody happens to be tuning in um, or any uh, people who are in Kentucky who happen to register, um, it is not a requirement for a seller to a peer to peer transaction per se. Thank you. Um, are there any other questions out there in the audience? I don't see any more raised hands. So I wanna do a final call. Um, I see another question in the chat. What's the difference between NACA and FHA from William? I can, I can answer that one. Um, there are a whole ton of, uh, there's like a long list, um, but in short, uh, NACA is a nonprofit organization. It came about uh, the founder, Bruce Marks, um, sued and revealed predatory lending by big banks like um, Citibank, Bank of America, where they were targeting like people that had English as a second language, um, uh, African-Americans, immigrants, and they were stealing their equity um, with these kind of uh, predatory loans. And so um, by suing them, he basically acquired uh, about like billions of dollars for down payment assistance and closing cost coverage. So you can get a multifamily property or single family property with 0% down um, with the NACA program. The requirement, however, is that you live in the property uh, for the entirety of the, the loan on that program. Um, FHA is just a, a little bit different because it's like federally um, backed with like the, the Fannie, uh, the Fannie Mae um, loan. So uh, that's the difference in it. Um, and the down payment is 3.5% plus closing costs, whereas NACA is 0%. Um, and there's taxes and insurance payments, but you don't have to pay for the down payment or closing costs. Thank you. Any other questions? Don't know if I'm missing a question. Um, okay. Okay. Any other questions? Final call. Raise hands, chat. Okay. I want to take a moment to thank all of our panelists. Again, this was a wonderful session. I really hope everyone walked away feeling like they learned something new and that they can participate in real estate investing as well, because you can, you can absolutely do it. Um, so just thank all of you for joining us tonight. Um, we'll be sending out contact information and additional resources um, in the coming days, but I want to wish everyone a great night and happy Black History Month.